Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis, and really happy and excited today to be celebrating the 30th anniversary of Cop and a Half. I can't believe it's been that amount of time, and we're here with Norman Golden II. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. So, I think your life and the journey you're on really demonstrates something that many of us think about, which is what it's like to be a child star and land in this role and something so big. And for you, the journey was definitely circuitous. If I'm not mistaken, you were living on the East Coast uh, towards North Carolina mm -hmm. when you first started with a workshop shop all the way out here and you were a kid. Talk to us about sort of that experience of kind of really getting introduced to the business <laughs> from the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, you know, we, uh, my family and I uh, lived on the East Coast. Incidentally enough, we used to live in, we were in California prior to that. Um, mm, okay. Parents, their you know, jobs kind of switched, so you know, sure. we had, a, you know, had to go there for, um, my father's job took us there. And so, you know, over the years, you know, as a tight-knit family, so we would watch, you know, family shows, and, you know, I would see the kids on these shows, sure. and, you know, always say, like, I can do that, I want to do that, I'm going to do that someday. And, you know, the type of parents that I had, you know, I'm fortunate for them to, you know, basically, never you always encourage you know those goals mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um it just so happened that <laughs> my uh, auntie had her son enrolled mm -hmm. in a you know acting workshop mm -hmm. and uh, one night her and my mom were talking and my mom was like this dude this boy keeps telling me he's gonna be an actor and yada yada so you know my auntie's like well you know she encouraged her she's like yeah he's you know he's very precocious smart the whole nine so you know you should maybe look into it so um my mom and dad, you know, they enrolled me in the courses. So we were in North Carolina. Courses were here. Right. We, I was fortunate to do the courses because my parents worked for the airlines at the time. So mm -hmm. we got okay. the buddy passes. So we would, sure. I would fly out on a Wednesday. We do the, you know, uh, the, you know, the class and fly back. The next day I would go, you know, to school the next morning. Right. Did that for six weeks, and then after, you know, at the end of the the workshop, you know, I was approached by I was like three agents mm -hmm. and a manager, you know, all wanting to rep me because of the great work and sure. potential that they saw. Sure. So, you know, it, it that was, I guess, the the origin story of how you know everything just kind of, you know, snowballed from there. Actually. Sure. And this isn't something that's automatic, and I think sometimes people can believe it. I mean, wow, what a dream come true. I had been in Cali, but like I said, you were living in North Carolina time. You get into a workshop essentially out here. Yeah. Um, somehow making that schedule work is incredible to imagine that you yeah. can sit back to the East Coast within 24 hours and not be missed at school. Right. But there still was no walk in the park just because the agents had discovered you. You still had three, maybe 4,000 other kids to compete, yes. because if I'm not mistaken, this was the sequel to Kindergarten Cup. It was conceived as a sequel to okay. Kindergarten Cop, but because of, you know, development turnaround and all that kind of stuff, it ended up kind of morphing into its own, you know, project. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, as you mentioned, just want to speak on that, you know, 3,000 kids and, you know, the sacrifice that, you know, my parents and even my, my, all my family, because I have two siblings as well, right. that, you know, they, they um, you know, the support sure. was there for me to, you know, to do this. And that's not lost on me. I mean, it's, that's a, it's a huge you know, undertaking to, you know, pursue, pursue that, that type of career, you know, um, at that young of an age with my parents and everything. So um, I'm just, I stand in gratitude for that. Sure. You know, for sure. Sometimes I don't think people realize literally the magnitude of what we mean by that. So let's break it down. We've got, you have an agent mm -hmm. or people have assigned you, but we got 3,000 plus, maybe 4,000 kids auditioning. Yeah. Yeah. That ultimately gets down to 150, which ultimately gets down to six. Mm -hmm. And then if that's not enough, now you have to screen test. What is that? What does that mean? And how did that process go? Yeah, so it got, got down to six. I was, well, it was two from New York, two from like the Midwest, I want to say Chicago or whatever and then it was two two kids from here I was one of the kids from LA and oh and so by that time just kind of on a side note irrelevant my parents were fortunate enough to relocate to okay. LA so I right. could audition and whatnot oh. um, and up to that point I hadn't really booked anything other than the TV show and I had been auditioning for like a year and a half or so so right. it was 
it, it is a process, like you mentioned, but back to your question. Um, so yeah, the, so the screen test got to that. And, you know, historically, you know, Burt Reynolds didn't do projects with kids. Right, ever. You know, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> ever. Never. You know, so um, he was a little, you know, nervous at, you know, that point. But, you know, th I think it was necessary for him to see, you know, what he was working with. And fortunately for me, unfortunately for maybe the other kids who got to that screen, that point, you know, mm -hmm. the screen test uh, part, but fortunate for me, I was able to basically, you know, hang with him and he was surprised like I mean he would slam his hand on the desk and you know shout and die ah, and you know and in his words he's like yeah the kid didn't flinch he was just right there with me he would go off put like you know we would have our you know, you know scripted portion and he would go off page I'd follow him and he'd go back on and I'm right there so he's like yeah if I'm gonna do this film it's gotta be with Norman because you know he's, he's got it you know so that was definitely my fortune sure and another thing too that I think the public may not often realize is that these types of films, even though it was, like you said, somewhat of a sequel, um, with a lot of changes to say the least, because Arnold doesn't tend to do sequels, right. um, so he wasn't going to be in it. Yeah. Um, this whole development process, this took a lot of time to get all these people, all these children um, screened, to then try to get it casted as well, and yeah. trying to find somebody who might fit and be willing to do it. So it sounds like it almost literally was thrown in the trash, you know, saved in a stitch of time, so to speak. Yeah, it was. Um... You know, I, I believe, well, you know, like you said, Arnold doesn't really do sequels. I believe Macaulay Culkin was, you know, he, there were talks for him being, mm. you know, uh, signed on Home Alone 2, right. as we all know. Yeah, yeah, it was a little bit bigger of a <laughs> Yeah, project. a little bit bigger project, so he's like, yeah. <laughs> a little bigger budget. Yeah, and also, too, it was, you know, the development time for sure. Cop and a Half just wasn't going along. So, you know, right. as, as actors, you got to take kind of what's coming. You can't sure. wait, you know, right. for something. So that way, you know, he was in that position as well. But um, yeah, it uh, it definitely it was it was a process. Um, it almost you know they almost decided not to do it with Burt Reynolds again. He, you know he didn't really do films with kids, so he was kind of on the um, on the like like I don't know if I want to do this because this is just you know, development of hell so to speak right. and all yeah. that. And um, but it was. <laughs> From what I heard, it was uh, his uh, associate producer that worked with him, Elaine Hall at the time. Right. Um, you know, she kind of appealed to his ego and was sure. like, well, you know, they wanted this person and <laughs> that person. So, you know, if you don't want to do it, I guess whatever. But you weren't the first person, you know, you weren't <laughs> exactly. the first choice. Right, and right. So, that's the way to appeal the ego. Hey, <laughs> yeah, so he's you're thinking, taking crumbs, so you better think about it. Right, so he's thinking, he's like, hmm, okay, so I have evening shade. You know, this is a time for me to kind of, you know, I do movies. So, all right, I think I'll, I'll endure. And I'm glad he did because, you know, the rest is history, I guess, for me. Sure. Know? Let's talk about the history of what it was like working with someone like that, you know, on set and things like that. Bert was an amazing individual, you know, may he rest in peace. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better opportunity, you know, meaning, you know, the, the first like major role that I did to work with a person like him. I mean, the history, his history in the industry and I mean, just his, his work, his body of work and um, experience and whatnot uh, really went a long way for me learning the craft and, sure. you know, just kind of observing. I mean, obviously, big age difference. I mean, he's sure. however old, you know, right. but, um, you know, just him being there, you know, and, and incredibly, <laughs> he didn't like to do films with kids, but I think he, he you know, he's really good with kids, actually. Sure. Um, so, I, yeah, man, I, I really, really appreciated having that opportunity to work with him. Sure. What's one story or something that surprised you or obviously you wouldn't have only known but so much about him, but that, you know, happened where you're like, I'll always remember that, you know, a special uh, bond that we shared or thing that occurred? Oh, man, there were, there were a few, uh, fortunately, you know, but I think if I had to pick one, it would be, so there's a scene in the film where I had to skateboard, you know, on cobblestone, right. and, you know, I, before the film, like, I didn't skateboard, sure. I just rode bikes or whatever, so I had to learn how to skateboard and, you know, learn how to do all that stuff, and so I was nervous, I was sure. really nervous, and I was visibly nervous, like, okay, I have to skateboard on this cobblestone, you know, brick you know, sidewalk, how am I going to do this? And so, you know, he, he sat down, and there's actually a photo that was captured. Him and I were talking, and, you know, he was telling me about um, some of his films that, you know, 
biggest stunts that he had to do right. and you know the one stunt that actually almost lost his life and you know um which kind of I'm like okay <laughs> that's not helping <laughs> he's not helping <laughs> but you know he the way that he you know he wrapped you know wrapped it all up and said you know you can do anything as long as you believe that you can and so what that reminded me of was when my parents would say that and I had teachers you know I had a teacher that used to call me a genius right. and my grandmother would always say hey you know you, you you know you're able you can do it sure so just with him saying that, I was like oh okay well let's go you know and he's like in the, in the worst case scenario you fall you hurt yourself but you know we're here right. we got you you got support like right. you know you're, you're good so that that always you know sticks in in my mind Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, you kind of parlayed that role into a film that you did with Oprah, nonetheless? Well, yeah, well, not necessarily parlay. I mean, I, I, Oprah saw my performance mm -hmm. in Cop and a Half, and, you know, she she actually offered the, the role, um, which was surprising because Cop and a Half being comedy, lighthearted, you know, sure. and then there are no children here being very dramatic, sure. you know, kind of, you know, like black and white, sure. um, or, you know, very stark difference. Um, but I guess she's, what she saw was that, and this is her words, like that gift mm -hmm. that, you know, I had as an actor being able to be so sincere with, you know, the, the you know, my material, sure. you know, as an actor. And, and having that so young was definitely, you know, impressive. So she's like, I, I want Normandy Golden to be, you know, one of my sons in this film. So, such an honor. Right, and well. two, two greats. And then yeah. one of the biggest challenges, it seems, is if one starts out so young and or so high, and we've seen some of that even in today's interviews, mm -hmm. it can be really hard to start making transitions to yeah. other types of careers or prog um, you know, progress um, reports and things like that, um, where you're getting something that's not OK, not quite as of the same caliber. How did you make that transition yourself or how did you sort of come to accept that, okay, not every single role I do is gonna be with such a heavy hitter? Yeah. Well, my parents used to always tell me, even at a young age, like this is what you do and this is not who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, you are a magnificent individual who can do anything he puts his mind to. Sure. So with that understanding, you know, I. I had I was having fun doing what I what I did, and I think the difference between me and some of the other, I guess you say, former child actors that maybe didn't quite, you know, um, find their footing. And for the record, I mean, as you know, there's a lot of former child actors that actually have gone on to do amazing things. Right. So it's not, it's a bit of a trope, but it's not something that's like, you know, it people right. can you know work they, they keep working and they, they're successful. Sure. So for me, um, I held on to that that mindset, and you know. I mean, now, like, I, you know, I'm producing and directing and writing, um, but it's something that I, it's my passion. It's not like I have to have this in order to have an identity. I had that, you know, separate from, you know, Cop and a Half, you know, Burt, uh, uh, Devin Butler, Cop and a Half, or, you know, any of my characters, Pharaoh Rivers, There Are No Children Here, or, right. you know, Young Pip and Moby Dick. Like, those were characters that I did, and when I left that, I had a family, I had, I guess you could say a, a normal life, right. but a life, sure. you know, outside of, you know, the confines of, oh, you're so and so and so, you know. Yeah. So it's just about some of the projects you're working on now and sort of what it takes now that you have this other perspective to basically put things together. Before it was, okay, wow, I see some of the challenges of being in something that's in development. Now I've got to develop it myself and I gotta go yeah. out and put the whole project because um, it's very different when you're, you're an independent filmmaker. Oh yes, and you know, I'm in a very interesting situation where you're right, like, you know, I'm on one side of it, you know, just kind of waiting for the agent or the manager to call and say, hey, you know, we've got this offer or, you know, these auditions versus now I'm creating. So yes, it is is definitely a different ball game. But a ball game, I mean, I'm I'm having fun, sure. you know, doing what I do um, because, you know, again, I love the art of cre you know of creation sure. and telling stories. I think stories uh, are very. It shapes everything that shapes and molds everything that we do. Um, it's kind of a back and forth relationship with that as well. I was actually having a conversation with my wife um, a couple days ago about like music right. and how you know it, it has that healing you know ability you know, 
talked about vibration and frequency and, and just artistry as a whole. And I think that that's the most important part for me and what I do and just keeping that first and everything else. You know, obviously, you know, I do what I do to share with the world. So, you know, all the steps to do that is necessary. But the first things first is like, why am I doing what I'm doing? And how do you sort of really overcome some of those challenges? Do you feel like, oh, I do turn to music, or I disengage, or how do you actually face some of these challenges of, you know, financing and budget and staff and actors and things like that that it takes to kind of put a project together that's that large? Well, number one, keeping keeping my mind right. Right. Yes. <laughs> Staying in shape. Yes. You know, um, I think that's you know if, if your your mind and your your physical and your mental state is not you know in alignment, then you know, it's easy to get caught up in, oh, this is not working out the way I want it, or, you know, because, I mean, with Cop and Half, we just talked about development hell, so to speak. Right. Um, but, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I've experienced that with my own personal projects where, you know, you think, oh, yeah, this is a, this is an avenue we're going to go down, and this is looking promising, and then, you know, investors pull out, or right. they can't do it, or whatever, so it's just, you know, um, me, because I'm, I'm a meditator, I meditate, and, you know, I'm also a Nietzsche Buddhist. So, you know, I, my spiritual practice and my spiritual modalities just really kind of keep me, you know, focused on, um, you know, what's, what's, at, what's at hand. And like I mentioned, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I want to, why is it important for me to tell these stories, you know, the way that I want to tell them? Right. You know? And it seems like your parents um, were really able to keep you grounded, so to speak, and not get yes. so carried away. What advice would you give imparting to parents who may have a child that's starring in some you know, amazing product right now or project with a household name or they themselves have their name on the show, which can be incredible? Yeah. I think it's incredibly important to stay grounded, mm -hmm. you know, keep, uh, like for parents with children, keep the, keeping the children grounded. Um, Understanding that, you know, because it's, it's to keep them grounded, but then when they're, you know, at premieres and they're doing these films and they have these adults, you know, like, oh, Mr. Golden, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. You know, it, it's, it's kind of like, okay, at home, grounded, but then I'm out here, this is my work. But I think uh, also, too, the relationship that, you know, you have with, uh, you know, your children is very important. I think the, the successful former child actors, and I'm not talking about the ones who've, you know, made careers as adults or they they were bigger than life but the successful ones of the child the former child actors that kind of kept themselves uh what do you say what do you call it like um kind of out of the line the, right. yeah the, the drama basically sure. um they had a really they had a good relationship with their parents mm -hmm. and it wasn't based on okay you're gonna go out and be the breadwinner it's like okay we're gonna support you in you know your your gift right and that's what my parents did for me, which, again, I'm eternally grateful for them for that. Um, and so my advice to any parent would be just to, you know, if you have a good relationship with your, your kids, and let them lead in a sense where my parents wasn't trying to do this, you know, me having me do this for them, it was for me. Right. You know, so that's a, that's a big, I mean, among other things, that's one of the, the more, more key things I would, I would say. Sure. Well, and where can we find you and all things about you? So I'm on Instagram, uh, Golden Child, mm. I I is how it's spelled. Um, I'm on Facebook, Normandy Golden Second, uh, and I have a website, uh, NormandyGolden.com, mm. and that's pretty much it. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much. I mean, your words are very inspiring, and like you said, in your mantra, brings it across. You're very calm. I see that meditative spirit. We love that, you know, on the show, kind of looking at the health aspects of how someone survives and thrives despite, you know, tremendous victories, but also potentially things changing and yeah. our lives will constantly change. Um, and the goal is to not sort of get lost in this process. Like yes. I said, I think there's a challenging dichotomy between really being a celebrity and then still going home and doing some dishes. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Case, exactly. Maybe. Take the trash out. <laughs> and so yeah. uh, they do say they're just like us and um, you come across that way. But also also, um, we just appreciate your sincere spirit of still wanting to give and be passionate about your project that, that you're doing and the products that you put out. So uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thanks. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. 